Saying my name, Daniel. How are you? Francisco, here. Francisco, fine. How are you? It's, it's difficult. It's, uh, it's a webinar. Ah, yes, a webinar. Well, uh, it's just a webinar. Merci, merci pour nous savoir échantre. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, yo empiezo de hablar un poquito español, pero <laughs> un poquito. <laughs> Let us speak English. Ah, Everybody okay. will uh, agree. Well, Daniel, we, we have maybe 100 people by Zoom and maybe 200 people by uh, YouTube channel. Fine, fine. Uh, yes. Good. Hi, all. Hi, Dr. Lichtenstein. It's a pleasure. Matthias. Good. Ah, can we take some whiskey before beginning? <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's coffee. coffee. Whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> coffee, coffee. I'll, I don't know I'll... how were your days. Are you not like to... to... Uh, go. I would like to present to you Dr. Jose Feijo, his medical doctor. Uh, who is Jose? I don't see the, the names. I'm Jose. This is Jose. Hello. Jose. Oh, Hello, Dr. Jose Feijo. Yes. Oh, I think we emailed together. Your name yeah, is familiar. We... We meet in Rosario. Uh, we met in Rosario yes. and we we wrote uh, before before meeting. Yes. Fine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Guido Gramberg from Formosa, Argentina, is medical doctor. Who? Hi, Dr. Lichtenstein. Nice to meet you in this room. Guido, hello. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. What time is it in, uh, in uh, Argentina? It's a minute to five. It would be five o'clock. Okay, we have okay. five Daniel, hours of... Uh, the, the idea, uh, we, we will present a PowerPoint with, uh, with the questions. Uh, our panelists will... We we'll make a questions, and you have all the time that uh, that you want. Uh, there are uh, fifteen questions, and uh, you use the time that that you want. It's no problem. Is there a limit for the no, webinar? No. Is it one hour? It's it's all that you want. It's no limit. You, you use each, each, each question time like you okay, want. Okay, okay. Fine, fine. How was your day, Francisco? You are still in a... Uh, equipped. Excuse me? Uh, Francisco, you, you, yeah. have, uh, you had a good day? You... Nobody is too tired today? Yes, yes, sure. Ah, oh, appear uh, Dr. Dr. Fernando Sosa. Hello, how are He's you? Another panelist, the medical Hello, doctor. Hello, Fernando. Hello, doctor. Pleased to meet you. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, the, and our physiotherapeutic is uh, Christian Benay. Hello, doctor. It's a pleasure. He's working here. Hello. He's working here into a lung ultrasound for physiotherapy. Ready? For, uh, for winning uh, ventilation uh, and all like that. Show me your name again, Christian. Fine. Christian. How do I see the names? Okay. Christian uh, Benai. Uh, we meet in Rosario in the last year. We were in Rosario. That was uh, Napoli, kind of too. After that, Dr. Uh, Pina from Mendoza, Argentina. Juan Hello, Manuel Doctor. Pina. How are you? 
Juan Manuel, fine, very well. Thank Juan Manuel you. from Mendoza, Mendoza, Argentina. I think I was. Maybe you had a, an airborne in, in in Mendoza, I think. Uh, I, I think I remember. Mendoza. I do not touch to my computer, but it's okay. And, and the last doctor, Isaac Cheong, medical doctor. Isaac. Fine. Hi, doctor. How are you, doctor? Very fine. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. From uh, which city? Uh, I'm from Buenos Aires. And uh, I did not ask to the other uh, panelists, other people. Well. Oh, I think we are ready. It's uh, 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. Yes, we, we could wait two, two more minutes. Fine. Uh, uh, how are you, Daniel? What, what about the, what about the pandemic in, in France? Are you working at the hospital? Pandemia? The <laughs> it's not there. Ah, ah, the pandemic. The word is pandemic. I, pandemic. I wrote pandemia. Uh, the pandemic killed uh, um, 80 people today, which means that it is really uh, decreasing. Decreasing. Yes. Fortunately, I lost uh, nobody around me. Fortunately. But many friends uh, and probably from the family had a little bit of the COVID, but it's okay. Uh, and and you, you, you are working with the lung ultrasound in uh, COVID patients? But I work uh, in uh, our intern. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, only IRDS with COVID. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Is is like RDS? It's only RDS or are difference? What is the, is the different RDS? I am Daniel Liechtenstein. I am not Luciano Gattinoni or uh, all this uh, world expert in RDS. <laughs> These people say it's not an RDS. So, what shall I answer? I understand. No. It's an RDS. But I don't know what is an RDS. Before knowing uh, Luciano, I said, RDS is not very logical uh, labeling. I just see a patient with white lungs who cannot receive uh, oxygen. Oh, it's okay. Not due to hemodynamic edema, as we all know. I will answer to your question. Maybe it's not yet time. Yes. Sure. If we include uh, if we include ultrasound, <laughs> lung ultrasound in the definition of IRDS, it will make a big change. Th that's my answer. Ah, it's really clear. Well, it's a good time to to start. Yeah. 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 We will share, uh, Daniel. We will share uh, our PowerPoint. Where, where appear the questions and the, the yes. panelists will make the question with you. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. In three, three minutes, two, two or three minutes, we will start. Fine. Uh, did I say, uh, uh, Pablo, did I say you hello? Hello, Professor, how are you? As well as you, fine. <laughs> Ready to spend Good a to nice uh, hour. Where, so, where are you living in Paris? Uh, is near. We could say the Eiffel Tower. Uh, if I go to the balcony, I see the Eiffel Tower. I live in the fifth district. Wow. Comfortable. Could you see the PowerPoint? 
Mm, I don't know. It does not look like a PowerPoint. I see your names. Argentina, 5 p.m. Discussion de casos. Well, it's. Yes, it's okay. Is it a PowerPoint slide? Yes, it is. The next slide is for start is the first questions. We will start in a minute. Fine, ready. Uh, one, uh, one, the, one of the questions uh, are near the end. We have a, a case, like, it's, it's a case for a, a woman with the dyspnea. If we have time and you are not tired, maybe we will present to you a, a case from Matias Brizuela from Cordoba. Uh, for, uh, that is a, it's a people with, uh, with a woman with dyspnea and we would like to discuss this case with you. But uh, after the questions. Fine, fine. Let me just make a test of a few seconds. Okay. Okay. Bueno, eh, buenas tardes a todos, eh, gracias por la participación. Eh, hoy tenemos la, la, la suerte y la, 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 el honor de, de poder eh, estar con el doctor Daniel Lichtenstein de, de París, de Francia, eh, nuestro mentor en todo lo que es ultrasonografía crítica, y principalmente eh, la persona que desarrolló en el mundo la, la ultrasonografía pulmonar. Eh, así que bueno, tenemos la oportunidad de tener varios panelistas de diferentes lugares del país. Eh, vamos a hacer diferentes preguntas y eh, se puede hacer las preguntas por chat que nosotros las vamos transmitiendo eh, al doctor Lichtenstein. Eh, ok, Daniel, thanks for stay with us. And, uh, uh, you are our master. Uh, we would like to, to be with you maybe in the future here in Argentina. Well, this is the, the first question from uh, medical doctor Isaac Chong. Yeah, uh, doctor, my question is, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how and when you decided to introduce the ultrasonography into lung evaluation? What a question. Yeah. I, will, um, I will answer logically. I began to make my first responsibilities in critical care in 1985. I'm not sure you were born. And I had to, in the night when I was alone, to steal the ultrasound uh, in the night uh, from time to time until I came uh, in 1989 at uh, François Jardin ICU. Mm -hmm. There was the echocardiographic machine on site. And yeah. so w when I was on duty, I spent all my time when the patients were uh, stabilized by studying the, the potential of the machine. And uh, so the veins, the heart, of course, peritoneum, and the lung came uh, little by little. It's a long and uh, boring story made of uh, surprises, then disappointments, then other surprises and little by little my idea was just to as it was defined in the article of 1991 i wanted to make a tool for the critically ill not for the intensivist or the emergency doctor or the radiologist but for the critically ill patient a tool allowing to see the patient so why why to not use the most vital organ? So I tried. I put the probe. It was not forbidden. Enfin, I did not know that it was forbidden. But I saw little by little, and that made a, a, a kind of a 
building okay. that grows uh, every year. And my last finding was uh, af before tomorrow. No, it was uh, two days before. Mm. Okay. So how? By putting the probe on the chest wall. And when? So I suppose it was in uh, 1989. Yes, it was so long time ago. The, I would say I did my last finding two days ago, but okay. it is, it, it is uh, insignificant. I was operational after maybe two years. That is in uh, 1991. I had the more or less the level that I have today. So I do not have 30 years of experience, but two years refined by the experience, but something very accessible for everybody. Okay. Yeah, very interesting, Doctor. Did you have a teacher to understand ultrasound? Uh, who is the question? Who asks? Uh, Francisco. Francisco. So Francisco. nobody asked me, you are the first. So I, I fell in love with ultrasound in 1983 when I saw my first examination by chains. And I went in a radiologic department in 1984. And Yves Menu was the guy doing uh, ultrasound. So he's the guy who learned to me how to take a probe, which buttons to push. And he was an expert in uh, liver and biliary tract uh, ultrasound. So I spent uh, uh, one stage in a radiology department. And the year after, I made my, uh, my curriculum in uh, critical care. Thank you. So Thank if, you. Menu, if, you, if you want a name, uh, <laughs> very respectable. Mm -hmm. But for the critical care, I had no teacher. Okay. No teacher in critical care. Okay. And no, it did not exist. And Daniel, uh, Francisco again, uh, what do you think that uh, um, critical care ultrasound uh, have to work into the critical care service or into the radiology service? Critical ultrasound must be done at point of care. That is not in a radiology department. First, okay. we should have to put the patient making a transportation. That is something that must be avoided by any means. And who would do the examination? A radiologist? It's not logical because I have received the patient. I know all about the clinical elements of the patient. So I will uh, contextualize the findings according to what I know from the patient. So ah. we, we, we examine our patients. We should examine our patient with the ultrasound. Thank you. OK, let's go to the, the next question from Isaac Chon again. Yes, yes. My second question is, uh, could you tell us about the advantages of using microconvex proof to evaluate lung? Can, can it be replaced by another proof? Well, so in this image, I see from bottom to top a so-called vascular, a microconvex, abdominal, cardiac, uh, vaginal probe. Yes. So, of, well, the, the correct answer, if I have any of these uh, five probes, it will be better than nothing. Mm -hmm. if, if I had to choose a probe, because I will be alone during a whole night, receiving any kind of patients, I, I would choose, the, let me see, maybe the upstairs, the vaginal probe, because the end is like the microconvex one. 
Okay. But I need to test it because I require uh, from a probe to be universal. That is, I need to scan all the areas of the human being. I need to see all the vital organs, that is, the heart, the lung, the veins, the peritoneum, the vital organs, the abdomen. And I am not a radiologist. That is, I need a good image quality, but not the perfection. The perfection has a cost mm -hmm. that you will have one probe like the so-called vascular, which will have a fantastic revolution at the first millimeters, but mm -hmm. will be limited in depth and in ergonomy. We are, I am not linear. Nobody is linear. The microconvex probe has a unique ergonomy. I would say my microconvex probe has a good range, and the range is not a word familiar to ultrasonographers. It means that I can see the superficie, I can see the depth, and I can give you numbers. I can see from 0.5 centimeters, that is the plural line very easily, up to 17 centimeters. That is, I will see huge pleural effusions, whole lung consolidations, and I can see the whole of the heart, and usually all the abdomen, including the aorta, in uh, most uh, patients. But uh, beware the copies. There are microconvex and microconvex probes. Look out. It's okay. Can it be replaced by another probe? Yes. So. If I see a vaginal probe, I would say, uh, give me this one. But usually the 99% of the doctors of critical care today have the three usual probes. I would say to them, well, take the abdominal. It's not the worst. Okay. okay. And when I, when I take an abdominal probe, I see things. I am happy. But at one moment, I will begin to be nervous. Okay. And at one moment, I will change the pro for another one from, for the linear, if I want to see near, cardiac, if I want to see something else. And changing probes, it's for me, uh, it's, it's, uh, c'est un, what's the word? It's not a victory. Uh -huh. It's not good to change the probe as many. Mm -hmm. It costs money, it costs time, yes. and it costs asepsis. I cannot be clean with uh, several probes. I made my examination with one probe. When I finish, I clean the screen, enfin, all the things that I touch with the hand, and my cable and my probe singular. And I am a clean doctor, uh -huh. which is a good idea nowadays with the pandemic. Yes. So if I say one probe, it's not for being original. It's really uh, critically mandatory. And uh, to finish, because we have uh, time, it's uh, the best compromise between all what exists to see the best of the lung, the best of the vein, the best of the abdomen, and for the heart, you will be maybe a little bit limited when you begin to make Doppler, etc. But for me, the heart is uh, some meat and some water, nothing more. I want to see how is the meat contracting, how is the water, that is the blood, large or not, I need very basic items that can be done with the universal probe, microconvex. And for a cardiac arrest, if I have the ID to use ultrasound for a cardiac arrest, I need to have a system 
that makes no second lost for keeping the brain safe. So I will see lung, one specific vein, abdomen, pericardium, heart, without losing time. Or I do not use ultrasound. And I nobody will uh, put me uh, to jail if I do like any doctor that is not using ultrasound. But if I use it, I make the CSAMI protocol that is a few seconds for switching on, a few seconds for the lung, a few seconds for one specific vein, etc. So no time to change the probe. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for this question. Yeah. Critical. Uh, okay. The best question. Thank you. Okay. The, the next from uh, Matias Brizuela, medical doctor from Cordoba. It's your time, Matias. So I see that there is an image, but maybe I can move our faces and I cannot. So, Matias. Some... Hi, uh, this is Zoom. Thing? Excuse me, but. Uh, I am not an uh, expert in Zoom and uh, I do not see the... Thank you. Can you hear me, uh, who, who is speaking? Matias Brizuela. Hello, Matias. Hi. Uh, Dr. Lissetain, uh, how can lung ultrasound help us in patients with RDS? Uh, I mean, um, the utility of lung ultrasound is clear in the diagnosis uh, since uh, your reports. Uh, but how can in RDS uh, help lung ultrasound in management uh, in, for example, in maneuver recruitment, um, recruitment maneuvers? Um, with PIP or in complication diagnosis? Well, for the diagnosis, it's okay. No, we will not speak of that. When we have the IRDS with the diagnosis, we can first see, as you said, the complications that is mainly pneumothorax, huge pleural effusion, atelectasis, all these things will be seen uh, immediately, including uh, venous thrombosis in a jugular vein, for instance, that is suddenly no longer visible, that makes the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary embolism. That's the CLOT protocol. And uh, for the recruitment maneuvers, that's what you said. Yes. Recruitment maneuvers. So, I work in uh, the department that was historically held by uh, Francois Jardin. If you visit this department, you will be surprised to see the level of uh, PEEP, always one number, five millimeter, six millimeter, seven, it's a big number, because we have one target, is to privilege the circulation by any means. And if you see uh, in this image a consolidation and you want to get rid of this consolidation, so you put the button of the PIP completely to the right at 30, 50, 100, 1000 millimeters, the consolidation will disappear. And you will be happy and you will even see the saturation of oxygen climbing upstairs, but at the expense of a circulatory impairment and we try to avoid this so what we do is to privilege circulation that is not recruiting as i understood using a peep and this is why a patient can keep the consolidations if the right heart works correctly if the patient does not develop uh, right heart failure, it will be fine, it will be controlled as far 
as I understood the philosophy of uh, François Jardin, of course. Clearly. Yes. So I know that many doctors use the loose. I think it's the good word. And they spend uh, one hour every day to scan all the areas of the lung. They make a score, the lung ultrasound score. But not in my department. All right. We see if the patient is better, it's like saturation. And I ask to my colleagues who say, you don't make the loose. I say, what will you do if you have a given patient who seems to improve oxygen and the circulation with your given therapy, and you see that the loose worsens? What do you do? Will you discontinue your therapy? So in this case, I'm sorry, but the, the clinical findings are superior to the ultrasound findings. And clinical findings are also the blood saturation. In one sentence, we try to simplify. And I am maybe completely wrong. Maybe. Here we are not in science. We are dealing with IRDS. And in this field, the gold standard is the most difficult things to obtain. So I speak of something that I do not control. There are too many data. The patients are too different from each other. The, even the cause of the IRDS is infection. So what? Which microbe? We don't know, we gave a probabilist antibiotherapy. It's not a very good begin for making a science. You understand? Yes, yes. Completely. If I tell you ultrasound is good for diagnosing pneumothorax, I have my gold standard, it makes no problem. But knowing what is good or bad with uh, IRDS, it's uh, too complicated for my understanding. And what is IRDS, etc. Today it would be an endless uh, challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Well, go to the next. Dr. Uh, Fernando Ariel Sosa. Hello. Fernando? Okay, uh, so maybe, I reached the... Uh, maybe he had problem with the, connect, with the internet connection. Uh, uh, hola. Uh, doctor? Hello. Hello, Hi. hello. In, in ERDS, we offer, uh, often we must pronate this patient. And uh, how would you use ultrasound in patient in the pronoun position? Uh, how do you implement the blue protocol in this patient? The question about prone positioning. Yes. I will ask you the question, does prone positioning work? Is it a good idea? I'll ask you the question. Can you prove scientifically that this patient will survive and keep his uh, profession better with the prone positioning or is it uh, indifferent? I ask you the question. And you will tell me. Yeah. Yes, it's better for this patient. For us. It's better for the it's better for the immediate saturation. For the immediate saturation but, and for mortality. Okay, so and it's uncertain. It's uncertain if the mortality, but it's good for the immediately oxygenation. Of course, but I am. I I think to be to be. Uh, 
schematic that possibly the prone positioning is the less invasive procedure for uh, improving a patient. I do not know, that was my, my uh, ID, I do not know the very uh, usefulness of prone positioning because it is a very hard work and uh, uh, complicated. Sometimes the patients have a difficult uh, wounds, uh, something very uh, heavy. Uh, my uh, last experience with a prone positioning was a patient who got a pneumothorax with a cardiac arrest while in prone positioning two days ago. It's not the best setting to diagnose immediately a pneumothorax. So I am sure it was a not the, the, the good moment for making this. I, I will tell you rapidly, uh, I was the first, I wanted to, to see what are the conditions of lung ultrasound to say this patient will respond to prone positioning, but it was uh, difficult to implement in, uh, in my ICU, so I cannot have uh, an idea. For this, specific question you should ask to experts. Uh, how to use the blue protocol? So I see that there is one uh, rather modern decision tree. You have the A, B, B prime, A prime profile. Uh, you can use the blue protocol in a IRDS patient. Normally this protocol is devoted to see a patient on admission in the emergency room or even in the street uh, at home to make a diagnosis. If you have the diagnosis already, you can make the blue protocol. The, it will be slightly different because the, the distribution of the B lines will be half uh, erased by your therapy. The lung consolidations will come and will be a telectasis or embolism or even a hemodynamic edema, the things will not be as uh, caricatural that on admission when the patient is still uh, untouched. You understand? Not. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's clear. But after uh, several days of uh, mechanical ventilation, well, we call that the pink protocol. When the patient has no dyspnea and no cyanosis, the patient is not blue, not dyspneic, but if these patients have no more lungs, if the lungs are completely white, they are not uh, completely healthy. And here we make the pink protocol, which is a kind of a extended blue protocol with more points than only three, with a procedures with different uh, thinking. I do it uh, briefly. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Professor, you, we doctor. have a... So, so you, yes. you use the blue protocol to ask me the question. You have a technical question that you did not understand on the blue protocol, uh, ask no, no. me because... Uh, Fernando, ¿tenés alguna duda sobre la parte técnica? Ah, it's ok, profesor, it's, it's, it's clear the, the, the answer. Se debe el audio, I don't know. Could you hear me, profesor? I hear you, yes. We, we have uh, one of your, your friends the, from Venezuela, the, um, Dr. Elizabeth Hirschhout. Hello, Elizabeth. Nice to speak with you. Elizabeth, are you there? Well, maybe, maybe so late. Okay, next questions. from Dr. Uh, Juan Manuel Pina from Mendoza. Are you there, Juan Manuel? Yes, I'm here. 
Wow. Can you hear me? Yes. And I see. Hello, doctor. I can see what you are doing. Okay. Hello, doctor. It's ni nice to meet you. It's a pleasure talking to you. And Thank you. my first question is Do you have experience in lung ultrasound with pregnant and pediatric patients? Yes, uh, no. The experience that I had in the neonates in the intensive care unit of a Necker hospital is just impossible to publish. That's a great failure of my life, rejected, rejected, rejected all the time. But if I want to to tell you very rapidly what I saw in this experience that was done uh, long ago, I had the very big surprise to see that there was no surprise. That is, I was scanning babies like the one we can see on the picture, and it was uh, with a cardiac probe, especially that, that is the worst, and I said, what shall we see in a neonate? And I saw little by little that we saw exactly the same 10 signs that we see in a adult, in a old patients. There's no difference. The signs are the same. The diseases are different. They have uh, meconial aspiration, the, the transient tachypnea, uh, the surfactant uh, issues, but the signs, will come from the 10 signs that are published, that are used in the blue protocol. Okay, and in, with, with the same probe, with the microconvex probe, or use or another probe? Well, so uh, I had, for my, in my experience, I, I could not uh, take my probe because of the... Oh. My my adult microcomplex probe begins at what is this noise interference? Um, I told you that, that my uh, Japanese microcomplex is at 0.5 uh, centimeter, and that is too much when you deal with a very small neonate. So with the pediatric uh, cardiac probe, I succeeded. Uh, to, to do the things, and I did not have the, the potential to, to do it uh, more than uh, du during this uh, study. So now uh, you will answer better than me. You, you will, uh, I know that the so-called vascular probe is uh, popular for the babies, but uh, it's not ergonomic, and you cannot see the heart. So I think that you can, if you have the, the, the privilege to deal with uh, babies and you have all my respect because this profession is not like all the others, you will make the experience and you will see with the microconvex probe a new world. To compare it with the images that we saw with the vascular probes, you will see a new world. Okay. I have no access to the neodates, but if you have, try. What is the machine that you use? In our uh, hospital, Manuel, we uh, have... Uh, uh, Juan Manuel is our, is our, uh, Juan Manuel is our master in critical care pregnant patients because he, uh, yes. he's working in a maternity. And which uh, brand do you use? Which machine? Uh, a Philips. Uh, which one? I don't remember yet. Uh, it's a, it's Philips. Aote. It's Aote. It's yes, Aote. but now, si, sí, tenemos un Aote y tenemos un Philips. Nuevo. Uh, the best microconvex think... probe that I know uh, came from the Philips Epic. I used it, I said, 
this probe is better than all the others that I used. So maybe uh, you can ask them, uh, give me the probe for just uh, one month. But you must, I speak to the planet, you must make an opinion on this probe. The world experts say to me, Daniel, uh, I don't have your probe. It's not a scientific answer. It does not say, Daniel, your probe does not work. They say, I do not have your probe. So they should, as experts, make their experience. So just telephone to the company and say, uh, from Daniel Liechtenstein, can I uh, use your uh, microconvex probe uh, with a here high frequency, of course, for the babies? You will give me your opinion. And if you want to see the lung and suddenly the baby is not well, you want to see the heart or the veins, especially the veins that are difficult to access, you will be happy. Yes, in Argentina, usually we, we don't use the microconvex because uh, it's not a common probe. Uh, maybe we could replace it for a face array. Excuse me, it is not the common probe, but if you don't begin, it will never be the common we're, probe. Yes, we, we, so I think we, we that are you beginning must, now. Yes. So if you ask to the company, please, do you have the microconvex probe? They will say to you, no. But if the telephone rings five minutes later and another team asks for this probe and 10, 100, 1,000 times, they will make a meeting and they will say, all the doctors want the microconvex probe. We are here for what? For the money. If they want the microconvex probe, we shall make a lot of business, a lot of money if we build and sell these uh, probes. And if we do not do that, another company will do that and make the money. If I was a manufacturer, I would think uh, this way. So you can help the world by asking uh, microconvex probes. Even in Argentina, what is Argentina? It's, it's a, a, a country like at equality with uh, all the other countries. So you can maybe begin the revolution of the microconvex probes in Argentina. Why not? Because I admit that up to now it is uh, difficult to to implement this probe. I see the years are passing, one decade, two decades, three decades, but I know that this probe will prevail. Maybe in 50 years, maybe in 49, but it will prevail. Just test it. Insist with the companies we have to work on it. Make your opinion. Of course, we speak, it's a webinar, we should be together, and I should see with you that this probe is serious, that this one is a bit disappointing, a lot disappointing. It's I know the equipment that I use. Uh, for the babies, I told you that one probe from Epic Philips is probably an excellent choice. And maybe um, I, I cannot, uh, well, I should, uh, I should once again make an, uh, an experience to work in a, neonate ICU to, to test the machines. So I, I cannot answer now, you understand. I can yeah. give you advice, but do not buy a probe before testing it uh, first. If you buy, 
you buy a microconvex probe from one of the biggest manufacturers, which are from North America, very, very popular in the emergency rooms, you will be disappointed. You will see not a lot with that probe. It will be blurred, you will be unhappy. But if you try with other machines, you will see that that's the probe of the future. So I speak of what I know that is my Hitachi microconvex probes in adults and also some other microconvex from other companies. But for the neonate, we must see that together. Especially, you deal with uh, prematures. Do you manage uh, premature babies? No, doctor, no, no, uh, just pregnant women. Uh, pregnant women? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I, I speak of the baby who is uh, alive. He, yes. The, the baby in the uterus is not my field. Okay. Too complicated, it's another world. Or I, the only thing that I can see in the intrauterine baby is a whole uh, lung consolidation, 100%. It's uh, very scary, but it's physiologic. Yes, yes it's physiologic. Do, do you see a lung disease in a intrauterus babies? No, doctor. No, no. no Because yet. if you speak of, uh, how do you call that, uh, malformations, absence of uh, lung, uh, it's not my field. I have no experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for your advice. Let's keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. The next is from Juan Manuel again. Number six. Starting doctor. with COVID. Okay, doctor. My second question is, do you consider that the blue protocol can be applied in patients with COVID-19 due to the patty lesions produced by this disease? This is uh, COVID-19? Yeah. Yes, COVID-19. Is this patient in the intensive care unit? Yes. For IRDS? Pardon, se escuchó bien la pregunta? Sí, sí. It's a distressed patient uh, into the critical care unit with mechanic ventilation. This patient. Uh, wow, wow, wow. Well, you, you can do a blue protocol in a, any living person. If you make a blue protocol on me, suddenly you will make a diagnosis of a asthma or COPD, that is a, the nude profile. But I am not dyspneic, so that is More, more area for, for make uh, an ultrasound scan. Yes. Ampli protocols have only six areas. No, so, three. Three per lung. Three per lung, yes, yes. of course. So that is, that is the question. If, if you think that with blue points, superior and inferior blue points and, and flaps point, if enough, To, to scan all lung uh, in, a, in a disease with patchy lesions. That is in the COVID-19 IRDS. I cannot answer to your question. 
Okay. I would love to answer to it, and maybe I will uh, by the by the par le biais, enfin, with uh, Francisco Tamagnone. Maybe I will answer to you in a few weeks. But if I speak of something that is not published, it will maybe be rejected because maybe I am wrong. When you make research, you can always be wrong. So when the community accepts your work, you can speak of it. If no, it's not honest to speak of something that is not published because maybe I will say completely wrong concept. So up to now, I will say to you, do the comprehensive protocols, do as it is written, as it is published. It's much, much better than no ultrasound at all. Okay, we, we, we have more time to, to speak about this. No, I said all what I know. Okay. Thank you, doctor. It's a question of a scientific honesty. Yes, sure. The next, from Guido Gramber. Guido, are you there? Hi, doctor. Guido Granberg. Yes. Who is that? From Formosa, yes. Argentina, in the north of Argentina. Hello, Guido. Hello, dear doctor. Uh, in your large experience, uh, at time, which pathologies are associated to B lines? Uh, you recognize uh, any difference with regular pleura or with irregular pleura? Which pathologies are associated to B lines in patients with regular or irregular pleura? Uh, what do you mean, irregular pleura? What is it? Uh, we, are, we are showing in the COVID patients uh, appear with uh, B lines or interstitial uh, B lines with yes. irregular pleura uh, with uh, Sometimes disappear the, the the pleura. Could you see at the uh, at the video at the right right and down? Uh, what is a irregular pleura? I do not understand. I, I never use this term. You will. No? I I I've, I wrote uh, six books. I succeeded to publish uh, not a lot of uh, publications. You will never see the word irregular pleura. Irregular pleura. Uh, no, no, I do not use this term. I think, uh, that, it, I, I think that it refers to C lines, maybe. Or, uh, what is C line? C line, uh, I know this term because I, I, I created this term for uh, lung yeah. consolidation. Here, there are three images. The, the left, I do not see lung consolidation. To the right, at the top, I do not see lung consolidations. To the right, at the bottom, I see a lung consolidation. What else? A small consolidation. Well, not so small, maybe uh, one centimeter. That is uh, substantial. So to answer your question, which pathologies associated to B lines? Um, you know, a B line is not a disease. You know, uh, several B lines. Something like you think it's pleura. It's no um, can you repeat? There are several people speaking. Uh, doctor, you say that is no relevance, uh, the meaning, uh, the presence of regular of irregular pleura.
when I see the lung of a patient, I search for lung sliding, I search for interstitial syndrome, I search for alveolar syndrome and pleural effusion and pneumothorax. I do not search for an irregular pleura. The patient to the right, at the bottom of the right, has consolidation. If I see this pattern at the anterior chest wall, I will say this is a C profile. And I will see the blue protocol and I will see C profile. Ah, it's a pneumonia. Simple. Maybe, maybe Guido wants to say uh, thinking pleura. Thinking. I, so I will ask a question to Guido. Ah, okay. You see that the I will ask you the question. You see that the pleura is thickened. It is thickened. You say yes. yes. And yes. I will ask you, thickened. Okay. I will ask you a very specific question. Your pleural line here is thickened by what? That's my question. Uh, I don't know. Ah, I know if I can help you. This plural line is sickened by water fluid. Fluid in the alveoli, alveolar consolidation. So I ask to the community the effort to keep a consistent terminology, a consistent nomenclature that is lung sliding, lung rocket, lung consolidation. The consolidation can be very huge or substantial or small, like here. But why to change the words and why to speak of irregular flora? So it's just a question of a methodology. But if we understand the pathophysiology of lung ultrasound, we use the good methodology, a logical one. So to answer your question, the patient that I see to the right at the bottom has a C profile. Of, I suppose that we are at the anterior wall. You did not tell me. Uh, what is this? Uh, where is the probe in this patient at the right bottom? Is it anterior, Probe? lateral, posterior? It's anterior. Yeah. Anterior. Anterior, so there is a C profile. Okay. Which is, I guess, I would say a pneumonia. Look out to the filters, because I have the feeling that to the left there are some B lines that are multiplied by a probably a compound a filter. And even to the left, and maybe upstairs, upstairs also, uh, look out to the compound filters. It multiplies the B-line. It gives you the feeling that the patient has either too many B-lines and the patient has not too many. And you can also have the feeling that there are no B-line at all, which is even uh, worse. So I, I think... These machines are Philips, Philips, Philips. You, you should uh, quietly find the way to desactivate. You will have uh, better images, I suppose. Here, we can make a diagnosis, but because we are experts, we do that all day long, but if we want to teach to younger, uh, they will maybe be um, not comfortable. Uh, okay. Did I uh, answer your question? Yeah, yes. doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the next from Fernando Sosa. Are you there, Fernando? Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I don't have a good season time, but I, I can hear. Uh, doctor, how do you assess if the progression of cystic syndrome is getting worse? 
well, uh, were some, I would say the, the simple answer would be uh, how should uh, count the B lines. I should use the, the bad sign. I can say that in Spanish, the murcielago sign yeah. that I do not see in this image. So I have to think uh, what is the length of the plural line. Here, I see, uh, I suppose that I see one B line. So this is even not uh, interstitial syndrome, but if I see three B lines between two ribs, I would say septal rockets, that is a mild interstitial syndrome, that is only the thickening of the B lines, that is the curly lines, so to speak. If I see the next day that my patient is worse clinically with the double number of B lines, that is something like six, I would say this is glass rockets. Okay. That is ground glass lesions on a CAT scan. And usually uh, this corresponds to a worsening. If I see not three, not six, but let's say a 10, 12, that is it makes the white uh, Merlin space, that is the, the space below the plural line, I would say the patient is uh, likely uh, worsening. So I should just count the B lines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. The next for Jose Feijo from the military hospital. Hello, Doug. Hello again. Uh, the next question is, uh, in your opinion, what is the best way to differentiate a consolidation from an atelectasis? Well, I, uh, I waited this question and I am proud to tell you that I am unable to answer for three reasons. First reason, an atelectasis is a consolidation. It is a retractile consolidation from a René Lainé, who was the father of the modern physiology of the lung, a French uh, pulmonologist. You have retractile and non-retractile consolidations. And atelectasis is a retractile consolidation. So for me, there is no difference. I cannot, differ I cannot answer this question in the way it is uh, labeled. I would say, how do you differentiate a pneumonia from a atelectasis? I would understand a bit more the question, but I would ask you, I'm very sorry, uh, do you mean a, a passive atelectasis or a obstructive atelectasis? And um, if you tell me obstructive, here oh, we, obstructive. I know what you speak about. Yes, obstructive. Okay, so uh, on this image, I would be unable to answer because maybe it is because of the webinar, but the image is not moving uh, smoothly. And the dynamics is all in lung ultrasound. So here, I cannot make an opinion, uh, I see what do I see? I see a lung consolidation. I see a bit of pleural effusion. Some people would say, oh, this is a uh, pleural effusion with the collapsed lung inside. And I would say collapsed, excuse me, but where does the pleural effusion come from? And the answer is the pleural effusion comes from a lung consolidation, which is probably a pneumonia which is maybe a hemodynamic edema. Here it is possible. Uh, 
outcomes. As far as I see in this video will not help me because I do not see, but it is because maybe of the transmission because of the webinar, I am unable to see the dynamic air bronchogram. I will never bet on this image. I prefer to send the patient to CAT scan. <laughs> But I will answer to your question. Uh, uh, an obst obstructive atelectasis is opposed to a pneumonia because first, there is a, an abolition of teleectasis, a teleectasis, that is the lung will not inflate. If it is, let us take a caricatural uh, case, that is a whole lung atelectasis by an obstacle intrabronchial, I would see the complete abolition of lung sliding immediately. At the first second, so lung sliding abolished. Mm -hmm. The second point that I would see after several uh, hours probably is a lung consolidation that, that would be uh, accompanied by a decrease in the volume of the lung. So I would see the liver much higher than in the usual position or the spleen yes. or the intercostal space or the mediastinum. I would see a, a retraction of the organs, enfin, the retraction of the lung. And so the whole organs come in take the space of the lung. If I see an air bronchogram, if I succeed to catch that there is no dynamic, it will be a slight argument for the obstructive atelectasis. And if I see a dynamic air bronchogram with preserved lung sliding, and with no reduction of the volume of the lung, I would say this is not a obstructive atelectasis. Okay, thank you. The big problem is that usually when the atelectasis is small, we do not have an immediate gold standard. That is, we make therapies, we make physiotherapy, we give antibiotics, uh, more oxygen or less oxygen, and uh, we don't have the proof of the atelectasis at the given moment. And my research is uh, highly impaired by the absence of a gold standard. When okay. it is a huge uh, atelectasis, it's more easy. That's all Thank what you. I can say. Thank you. And the next. Is from Guido Gramber. Guido. Hello again. Guido, are you there? Okay, the next. Uh, from Jose Feijo again. Jose. Yes. Um, how long do you consider it is necessary to train personnel who have never had contact with lung ultrasound? That is a, a frequent situation that we have now with the pandemic. Well, if the doctor has no experience with ultrasound, the training will be probably quicker than if the doctor has a wrong uh, experience with a wrong uh, IDs, by the way. So if I had to train somebody who has no experience, uh, this question, you know, it's, uh, do you think I have experience in log ultrasound? I have only a three decade experience. I repeat, I improved myself two days ago, 
And so you never stop learning. So I cannot, I cannot answer. There is a moment where you have to decide that somebody is able to make ultrasound, but it is always risky. It's not a mathematic. Well, uh, who was at surf? Uh, uh, Elizabeth Hirschhout was at surf. I, maybe uh, I, f I don't know if I saw her, but uh, she can answer to you because I, I take the doctors uh, separately in very small groups and uh, I have the feeling that the way the surf, my uh, training center teaches, allows to be faster than with other concepts that make things more complicated, more difficult. If I tell you all the things that can burden your brain and confuse your concepts, the list will be very, very long. And what I say, this is the first slide of the lesson of lung ultrasound in the surf course, which are a whole body teaching, but uh, with 80% on the lung and the blue protocol. When I begin the lecture on the lung, I say, lung ultrasound is simple, but not so simple. But precisely because it is not so simple, please, we should avoid to complicate this subtle science with erroneous concepts. So if somebody is trained with the good concepts, it will be fast. And if you want a number, I would say that after three days of a complete uh, integration, the doctor will be able to do something. Two days would be didactic because you must see step by step, very simple concepts, very simple, but many. The difficulty is that there are many simple concepts. And after these two days of didactics and one day of a practical stage with patients, not models, but patients, and with a group of two doctors and not a hundred, I think three days you can fly by yourself. Okay. And, and make the beginning of a beginning. But uh, <coughs> the problem is that people who come to my training center uh, want to come. They come by themselves, so maybe it makes a bias. Maybe it is biased. The, the way to answer your question would be to oblige all the students or young doctors to make long ultrasound. Maybe we will have a bad surprise and we will see, ah, it is not so easy. Some people just cannot succeed. But up to now, the doctors who make long ultrasound, because it is not uh, mandatory, they do that by themselves. And so they, uh, uh, I have the feeling to study a COVID patient with the helmet. Uh, when uh, you, you, you understand, maybe it is more difficult than I think, or maybe not. The only way to know is to um, oblige students to learn. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So my answer is not an answer, by the way. Uh, yes, I have an answer. If you want to train somebody, you should train this doctor or person just to know, is there lung sliding? Just this question and the doctor will be able to answer after maybe uh, these three days of the course, and just lung sliding, which allows you to make uh, a lot of uh, investigations. And after to learn the B-line, we would add a little bit that would give to a person that is already able to take the first uh, flight. 
if we compare with uh, aviation. Okay. Well, so we have question. like. Uh, <laughs> it's necessary to go. To, uh, it's necessary to go to Paris and do the Seoul. We we have like a panelist uh, and Seoul fair. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth, are you there? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? A second. Ya, ya creo que ahorita sí me conecté. Hello. Hello, Dr. Lichtenstein. How are you? Nice to see you. The same. How are you? Well, in this pandemic, uh, we are a little bit uh, isolated. Isolated? To, uh, let's say uh, in, in our houses, but uh, trying to do the best. Uh, you are, the people are isolated in the house. That is, uh, confinement is the French word. Yes, confinement. But, fine. But the doctors are able to move. Uh, for me, it was not the confinement. I was moving a lot better than at any time because there was no car in the streets. It was a good time for going to the hospital. But uh, no, no scientific isolation, you speak. No, no. You isolation all, of, the, of the people, right. You have all you need for uh, taking care of the patients. So, uh, are you able to answer the question of uh, uh, Jose? Thank you, Jose. Thank, that you, is, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, to be with us from Venezuela. And the, and the next I, I was asking is, uh, her, Dr. Jose I, 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 was, uh, I was asking the question to Elizabeth, uh, oh, yes. if she can answer to the question of uh, Jose, that is, uh, how long to to begin to be uh, consistent for making long ultrasound. Because uh, Elizabeth was at surf, so uh, I never see uh, the people working uh, day by day uh, where they are. So do you agree that uh, three or four days uh, allow you to take your first flight? Yes, I think uh, if you have a good uh, supervisor, uh, I think you need uh, a supervision to do long ultrasound when you're on your own. It's, I think, difficult to see some signs. When you are supervised by someone that knows about long ultrasound, it's much easier. And if you have like a, a, a didactic course, uh, a program, very simple, it's easier. Uh, with the first three, four days, you can go and do ultrasound, but I think you need a little bit more of time to, to have a good diagnosis and uh, uh, don't make uh, mistakes when you're doing long ultrasound. So for Starting, I think it's uh, wonderful if someone can go can go and do the course in Paris. Uh, that would be excellent. And uh, so, uh, Dr. Listensen, I think is well one of the best uh, instructors. And after you have to do your experience in your working place with uh, a, 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 a much lot of patients. Of course. So, uh, what we do at SURF is to show to the attendees the usual mistakes. We, we take high attention to show precisely the mistakes. And I repeat, uh, you want to have an expert level in log ultrasound, but if we begin with one simple item like lung sliding, it is much shorter than learning the, the whole of lung ultrasound. So, up to now, but I made a surf in uh, South America already, uh, in uh, Colombia, in, uh, in, in some areas, also in uh, North America, in Asia. But uh, now, uh, 
with the airplanes, etc. It will be a bit uh, difficult during, uh, I don't know how many months. I think well, we will have to do it online through the computer. But we will try to do our best. I'm not very comfortable uh, online to be sincere. I am very happy to see you. That is the good point. But uh, to teach you, it must be presential, I think, with a patient who has the, the disease. Thank you, Doctora. Well. Uh, and the last, yes, the last yes. question is from Jose Feijo. Yes, so uh, uh, we, uh, we like to answer you uh, if you consider that the uh, ultrasound is useful to check the placement of a central line of, and uh, if it can replace an X-ray. Well, the question was simple for me because I see my, uh, I choose uh, subclavian veins, which are easy with a microconvex, not a linear probe. Uh, what do I need to know? Did I make a pneumothorax? Ultrasound clearly replaces X-ray. For the question, did I create a pneumothorax? Because you see the vein, if you have the good probe that is not the large one, but the ergonomic one, you are just in the subclavian vein, you, you cannot make a pneumothorax. By the way, the second point, did you go, if you choose the subclavian vein, did you go upstairs? The yes. answer is during the procedure, uh, just with the metallic wire, you take a look to the jugular vein and you will see the wire if it is going upstairs. So you have the time to do the maneuver again. But if you use I am sorry to be a bit uh, stubborn, but if you use a micro convex probe, you are able to be a bit outside the medial line. And so your wire will go naturally downstairs and not upstairs. So it is one more argument for having the magic universal micro convex probe. And now the last point, I will try to show you with my hand. If you insert your catheter, that is without pneumothorax, without going to the jugular, but going into the superior caval vein, uh, your catheter should be on the axis of the vein. If the vein makes a binding, the catheter will at each systole hurt until the moment where there will be a penetration. And for this reason, I would be just cautious. I would just say, uh, as far as we did not get completely rid of this uh, risk, uh, because it can be a, a perforation of the pericardium, enfin, you can imagine the, the drama, I would not be too much uh, excessive. I would, uh, not stop the X-rays uh, too fast. I would follow the Lucy FLR project. That is, we try to reduce in the three next decades one third of chest X-rays and two thirds of chest CAT scan. So we should keep maybe two thirds of X-rays. And for this reason, that is the catheter that should not be parallel but perpendicular to the venous wall, uh, it should be good to make less X-rays, but a minimum, of course. That's my answer. Okay. If, if other people have other experience, if you have the transesophageal echography very easy, if you make it 10 times a day to a patient, you can see that the catheter is uh, correctly placed. But they do that in my department, but uh, maybe not uh, everywhere. Okay, thank you.
Well, Professor, we have a, for the end, uh, if, you, if you are not tired, we have a, a case from uh, Dr. Matias Brizuela de Córdoba. Uh, he he has done a, a case from a, a woman. Are you, are you there, Matias? Matias? Yes, here. Well, um, hello, Matias. We we will present uh, this uh, clinical case. Uh, I have the opportunity to 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 manage uh, her, the patient. is is a female of uh, seventy five years old with hypertension, long time smoker. She has a sudden shortness of breath, and she uh, told uh, the night before she had a transit pain left calf. And in the present, uh, she uh, we we can saw uh, the facial cyanosis uh, without limb uh, edema and without human sink, and in saturation uh, at the air room with. 72% um, modinamically stable with uh, a heart rate of 110 <laughs> and a respiratory rate of 30 um, with no fever. The anatascultation, the, the lungs were clean and, and the electrocardiogram, she has so. Uh, all, only sinus tachycardia. That was uh, at the start of the of she came to the hospital. Please the next. So at um, uh, minute one, we um, have to manage the diagnostics possible of uh, pulmonary embolisms. COPD exacerbation, pneumonia, or cardiac heart failure. So, um, the next, please. At this time, uh, we implement oxygen therapy, but uh, we know. Um, we will not be able to have the decision to start aparin or thrombolytic therapies or corticosteroids or furosemid or antibiotics or mechanical ventilation because we have no another test. So, um, Francisco, please. Francisco. Sí. Please, the next, the next. And the Wells criteria for pulmonary embolies were only 4.5. So that's a moderate risk group. Uh, the chance of pulmonary embolies were 16.2%. Uh, so in, at this time, um, we have to deal with Dimero D, but we haven't. We have not the opportunity to, to dosage the Dimero D. Okay. Um, please, the next, uh, the next two, Francisco. So we implemented what we, we know, or we have a fast and better, than uh, angio CT or than X ray because X ray simple have a delay of 15 minutes in our center and the dimmer D is not available, pro and troponin uh, also not available. And um, we do what you, we know that is lung ultrasound and implement the blue protocol. Uh, is was um, um, 
a surprising um, 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 situation, but we don't have a, a start the machine, so we can um, preset the the image. So we use different proofs to obtain the, the image immediately. Uh, we start with the anterior blue points. Please, the, the clips, Francisco. That was the right and the left upper blue points. We can see uh, a profile. Can you keep the video a few seconds? Could you see the video? I, I see the video, but uh, it's not uh, very easy. I am not accustomed to this uh, image quality. Uh, may, maybe for the connection. No, no, it is the, the usual image quality. Uh, Unfortunately, that has uh, invaded the planet. So it is an abdominal probe. Yes, it's an abdominal and, probe. Uh, and the settings, I'm not sure that they are optimized for the lung. No, no, no. No, we're, no uh, we're not optimized by the presets of the machine because um, we start fastly and do the, uh, the a fast exam. Uh, because the patient was uh, really uh, in in a, in a bad way. Uh, precisely, so, precisely. That's why we need a machine that is ready yeah. on site immediately. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Henrit. It no, was no presented, pre so we did it um, as we start the, the machine, we put the proof in the in the thorax so we start uh, at this way okay um can please, you can please, francisco point the uh, yes this was the lower um, blue points of the right or the left so we uh, continue visualizing the up profile so anterior blue points, uh, it's all a so profile. Excuse me, uh, I have a question. Can I interrupt? Um, the image are, uh, how do you say, not regular, but like this, you see, saccade in French. Is it because of the transmission of the webinar or is it your, uh, your usual uh, image quality? I have difficulties to see the dynamic. Uh, no, if, for the the, if for the webinar, maybe. The dynamic yes, it makes a bit. Uh, yes. The, the patient was uh, really uh, with a uh, situation so um, I, you can see the, the moving of the, of the image uh, and probably not can um, visualize in the line of the lung, but uh, there was no uh, lung point and the line sliding was preserved. I trust you. <laughs> Please, Francisco. So at this time, we have present the lung sliding in the anterior blue points, and we obtain the upper profile. So uh, the this we realize a sequential venous analysis and the veins of the limbs. The, the lower limbs, the femoral common right and left, B points, 
this, the, the, the second image, upper and, da and down, at the top and the bottom, the p-points, the third, the popliteal veins, and the fourth image, the calf veins. I don't know if you can see, doctor, that the, all the veins were free of uh, thrombus. It's difficult for me uh, for s many reasons, but let us agree that this lower veins, especially she had a uh, leg uh, trouble, we, we will consider that they are uh, normal. Okay. Okay. Uh, at this time, we have a, an hyperfry with three veins at the lower limbs. But I have to say that we didn't scan the upper limbs and the next uh, veins um, because we uh, we didn't have time. We same thing in the we don't have time. We certain in the uh, the pain she had said she had in the calf. Um, in yes, yes. Leap, uh, left. So we had this situation with a blue protocol that uh, abolished uh, an up, um, a pneumothorax, uh, a pneumonia, probably, and pulmonary edema. And we have clean lungs uh, with no bronchospan. So we center in the pulmonary Emerson volume. So we... Excuse me, can, can you repeat the last uh, words, the last uh, 10 words? You, you ruled out pneumothorax, yes. you ruled out uh, hemodynamic pulmonary edema, and then say it again. And then uh, we have to look at the plaps, but we didn't uh, look uh, profile that uh, we can consider a pneumonia. Please, Francisco, show the plaps. Can I, can, can I tell you something just before we see the plaps? I wanted to say probably something at the left side. So this is the plaps point. That's plaps it. Point plaps point without pneumonia. Say it again. The plaps point without pneumonia. Uh, I'm not sure. Be believe me. <laughs> to the right, uh, I am not accustomed to these uh, acquisitions too. Ah, and and the frame that is, I have the feeling that there are four images per second that makes the thing uh, difficult. Uh, if I see the liver, the liver is probably uh, diseased, but we don't care. And to the, the left side of the patient, uh, yes, I, see, I, I see uh, uh, the unfractious image is what the, the stomach. We, we need to keep on the image. We need to, to see quietly where is the spleen, where is the stomach here. Well, let us admit that there is uh, no plaps, but I am not fully convinced to the left, but I, I am very, uh, I am very uh, uncomfortable. Ah, it's okay for but the left. Go on. Image. With, with the... Uh, from, from, the, from the beginning, I, I had the feeling that the patient had an A, B profile. A, B profile. But I, I, I had so, the feeling that maybe there was lung rockets to the left, but the word maybe is not in the blue protocol. If you come to surf, you will have my machine. You will understand what makes me uncomfortable. Uh, I, I am not kidding. No, no, yes, I, I, I understand you. Um, 
maybe we adjusting in adjustment of the presets we uh, could um, take a, a good image but there are a few things was, this was the situation and we interpret that the patient have no plaps okay let us admit so so we can admit that in this situation for the clinical situation uh, she had asthma or copd so we insist in the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and um, we know you uh, extend your pulmonary or your blue protocol to the uh, sus uh, patient suspicion clinician and the um, a sonography cardiac uh, uh, approach. So we... Uh, yes? uh, if, if, you, if you put your probe at the heart, yes. uh, I guess that you will see a well contractile left ventricle. I suppose that you will see a pericardium that will be normal no reason for a pericardial uh, uh, disease. Yes. And I guess that you will see an uh, enlargement of the right uh, ventricle, whether it is uh, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, uh, COPD, asthma, and even yes. pneumothorax, we will see. If we have the chance of, of a window, we will see probably uh, enlarge the right ventricle. So go on. Your answer is obviously correct. And please, Francisco, put the clips. So simple cardiac sonography. We didn't use Doppler in this situation. Excellent. To to decision, eh? to decision. Well, so so we here, go on. So we have a, a design because the septal interventricle was a plane. There is was a right ventricle enlargement. A very large enlargement, and there was a McConnell scene in this uh, apical four chamber view. There was an IBC uh, dilated without a collapse. So we admitted this, pre this patient had a pulmonary embolism in this context of clinical situation and with the upper profile and with a, a simple cardiac sonography. Simple cardiac sonography. You have a nice uh, culture. I'm glad to read uh, these words. Well, of course, the, the image is very uh, like this. I, it does not help, but here. No. Is, uh, is the streaming possible? Yes, but... yes. I, I will try to make the effort. So the right ventricle seems uh, very enlarged here, a bit caricatural. So here it should be probably good to think very deeply to the embolism here. Maybe she smoke, but if she smoke a lot of uh, tobacco, she would have uh, enlarge the free wall of the right ventricle that is not very easy to see in these images but uh, I, it's too difficult to see it's not uh, it is a cardiac probe well oh, yes. uh, so given the so I don't pay attention to the septal interference but it should be too long to explain let us admit that she has a uh, caricaturally enlarged the uh, right ventricle. The problem is that you would like to give a heparin, I suppose. 
Of course. <laughs> of course. The problem, the problem. <laughs> yes. And, and she made no bleeding. Of course, no. Oh, good. Good. So probably it was a pulmonary embolism that you treated uh, correctly. Uh, embolism without a venous thrombosis. Yes. Please, Francisco, put the, the next slide. Okay. The next, please. So at minute 10, we conclude that we have to, to give her uh, oxygen therapy and, and fraction heparin without corticos, without bronchodilatators, without furosemine, without antibioticos, and without mechanical ventilation and without non-invasive ventilation. So the, only that. Please, uh, Francisco. At 15 minutes, we have 88% of oxygen saturation, blood pressure estable, uh, decrease heart rate, decrease respiratory rate uh, without facial cyanosis and uh, mild dyspnea. So the clinical uh, optimization was good initially. Uh, how much oxygen? I, I suppose uh, a lot. What? A lot of oxygen, I suppose, uh, eight, 10 liters per minute. Uh, at, the, at the first uh, minute, we uh, have to put um, um, a masker with uh, 15 liters per minute of okay. oxygen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she, she came from 72 to 88. That is not bad. To she, 88 at air room. Air room, 88 at air room. Ah. Yes. Air so 15 room. 15 minutes with the, the bolus of airparin and the yes. startle of airparin. Next uh, slide. Franci that was uh, at date five, uh, the control at date five of the anticoagulation. The patient really improved her clinical here are the upper um, blue points right and left. Please Francisco the next here are the lowers. So can you stay on these images? Uh, the left. So uh, at the left, we, we had the feeling to see, uh, I had the feeling to see several B lines uh, on admission. Here, I see the yes. typical uh, bluff lines. That is the name that I give when I see yeah. one B line that is multiplied by the filters. So okay, here, okay. It's really a difficult uh, situation for me. Okay. Not because it will be midnight for me. Nothing to do. The, the images are difficult. So, yes, yeah, I, so I suppose you will tell me that she is making a pulmonary infarction at the lower uh, left. And probably yes. this, this is that. Yes. Probably. Uh, but uh, uh, to, to say uh if i am supposed to to make uh uh how do you call that an, an an expert opinion on this case i would be uh, uncomfortable i am not able to say there are long rockets there are no long rockets here no. i see no b line or maybe one maybe two but i agree that i see a small uh, consolidation that was yes. maybe missed initially, or maybe appeared yes. secondary. These are all the subtleties of a lung ultrasound, or medicine, by the way. Yeah. Okay. The next. Here, with the same proof, 
uh, to look at the at the this small uh, probably uh, sea lines can you tell us what do you think doctor uh, it's difficult because now the right image is uh, very dark where are we which point these are the at the plaps point with but with a linear proof yes so to the right i will probably say uh, no plaps to the left i would say probably plaps it's really difficult believe me yes, i am not not comfortable so a small plaps that looks like um, I am not accustomed. It will be. I hope that the pandemic will stop because uh, the it's not fluid enough. We, we I, I would say there is a plural effusion. Allez, a small. Oh point. yes, 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 yes. It, that's that's right. Uh, we are calling to Philips to to to. Um, they are. Um, could uh, send us a microconvex proof for the next case. I'll try. <laughs> Say, uh, we have a good friend from Paris uh, who does not say bad words about Philips. That's important. These are at the back. Voilà. So you see, excuse me to interrupt you. Typically, you can see the, the disagreement of the filters because yes. you see comet tail artifacts. And, and then that aren't B lines. But there are what I call bluff lines. Okay, they, okay. they say to you, we are two, but there is only one. Divided by two because of the filter. So here, there are not so many B lines, maybe one or two, that is not interstitial syndrome. But anyway, plural effusion to the right, and to the left, effusion to the both images. So there are even not B lines, there are sub, sub B lines, by the way. Okay. Because what we see is plural effusions. The next, Francisco? So at that five, the heart looks like this. What do you think? But I would love, I see uh, you and Elizabeth instead of the right cavities because the images are uh, downstairs. If we can, uh, ah, we, if, if I can push a little bit don't wait a second. I will try to affichant petit. No, this is not this. Masque la vignette de la vidéo. I cannot choose a zoom. It's too complicated for me. Uh, well, I, I will make an effort. I suppose that the right ventricle has decreased size and the left ventricle has increased size, which means that uh, the patient is much better. Yes, yes, and the IBC uh, really improved because uh, it's uh, more collapse. Ah, ben, the, there the was an obstacle that you succeeded to, but I am surprised that the heparin works uh, so fast. Yes, we um, after fifteen minutes is a very fast uh, success. Yes, we decrease the, the the liters of oxygen, but we have to maintain the treatment. We don't use um, um, alteplas or fibrinolytics um, because first we note a, um, a fast improvement in the clinical uh, of the patient. So we stop there. The patient never shocked. So we continue the, the, the same uh, treatment we start. And she was fine under your treatment, I see. Okay, okay. It's really a, a good uh, improve. So 
Uh, in this situation, we have to consider that uh, we use different proofs. Uh, this was uh, the delimited for not using a micro and unique in microconvex proof. We don't scan the upper limb veins. That was a, an error. And the clinical and cardiac uh, ultrasonography improvement after treatment, and the CT was not performed at the, at the beginning, but at request for, his, for her cardiologist, we have to solicit it at date 10th. It's she a bit late. Is, what? It's a bit late, but what did you see on the CAT scan? It was the cardiologist. Ah. <laughs> you don't know. We had to ask to Dr. Merlo why he called his request. So that was what the CT scan can show, what we can see in minutes, the CT scan could see in hours or days probably, but, but we don't have the opportunity to scan uh, at the beginning of but, the, uh, yes? Uh, do you see the embolism in, uh, in the CAT scan? Yes, because please Francisco, show this slide, the previous slide. The stream is too fast. The stream, uh, the, uh, yes, that. Note that it was um, really say a perfusion CT scan here in the in the lower image, and we have we can see the 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 pulmonary infarcts multiple. So, so and the thrombosis in the in the pulmonary veins, the so artery the, veins. Okay, so it was definitely a pulmonary embolism. Of course. Okay. 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 Good. So that was a, that's a typical case of a patient who has a profile. Let us admit a profile yes. with. Uh, no DVT, but severe dyspnea. So okay. she is in the situation where we cannot wait, we have to treat uh, immediately. So uh, we try to find, I, I would have loved to make myself the calf uh, scanning, because what I saw was uh, longitudinal scans done posteriorly with a linear probe. So I and and the image was not uh, uh, what's the word regular, so I would have loved to see one small DVT very far from the heart that is uh, uh, toward the foot, where she had the the pain. It was at one leg. Uh, I was not convinced with the to the to the to the scan to the veins scans. I was not uh, uh, convinced with the calf venous scanning because it is always more comfortable to see the very small thrombosis at the very end of the calf. You give heparin, you know that it is an embolism. If you have a completely nude profile, here in this situation, uh, 75 year old, I would have made a scintigraphy, but maybe you had no scintigraphy on site? No. Because if the lung is perfect, the scintigraphy will be very speaking. But uh, the, I, the I know it is, the scintigraphy is uh, an obsolete option nowadays, but I hope it will come back thanks to the BOO protocol. In this ah. case, for instance. Yes, because uh, I have to say that this patient had um, an echocardiogram uh, the, and one month before with normal cavities. 
okay. Uh, but imagine uh, uh, she has a severe pneumonia not visualized by your ultrasound or uh, severe COPD. Well, I think in one month, uh, a COPD patient will not increase the heart. So this is a good argument for embolism. I agree. Okay. Uh, well, Daniel, ha have you ever think have you ever think to add um, a cardiac ultrasound into the blue protocol? So my answer will be very simple. The blue protocol was published. You cannot change something that has been published. And by the way, the echocardiography is always associated with the blue protocol, but okay. associated is not included. So I will never include echocardiography in the blue protocol because if I do that, I will have to change the name. It will no longer be the blue protocol. Ah, okay. But uh, I, I suppose that you heard, as Matthias, I, I, I guess that yes. you know what is the extended blue protocol. Yes, of course. I, I guess that because I know uh, where you take your uh, culture. And the e-blue protocol includes various items like simple echocardiography. When you have the, the luck to have a good window and a caricatural, caricatural right heart enlargement, with of course the, the caval vein that makes the, the same uh, behavior, I think that you can uh, treat the patient, I would say. Give, uh, given the volume of the right ventricle, I would say uh, there is only one diagnosis. Well, um, I have to, to, to take more experience to scan the veins because I, um, I see a lot of patients that came to our center with um, pulmonary embolisms. We had the, um, an air profile in the lungs, in the scan um, of the lungs. We have uh, changes in the heart, and we don't see the, um, the venous thrombosis. Um, so maybe it's, um, um, I had to train more in looking, but I think uh, I um, have to say how to say um, lost in time uh, scanning uh, all the veins. Uh, if I, um, I if I have a clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolisms and I delay the treatment of the patient. Excuse me. Uh, this is my fault. I am unable to publish my research. Each time I submit it, it is rejected nine times and the tenth it is accepted. So one paper takes years. So you do not need, but it is not published, it is always rejected. You do not need to scan all the veins. You need to scan, as you said, I heard you speaking of the common femoral vein, of the V point, which means that you have read uh, my book because yes. the V point is in no publication, but only in my book. And the cal points is uh, sufficient. And the popliteal vein is not mandatory if you scan above and below, but it's always good to, to have this. But the timing is precisely the big advantage of the blue protocol. That is a profile, it takes a, uh, less than half a minute, one point, Carmen maneuver, two points, multiplied by two. And uh, by the way, if she is from the 20% of the patients who have severe embolism with no longer any uh, thrombosis at the lower extremity, it's part of the blue protocol that is, uh, the sensitivity is only <coughs> in the article, it was uh, 81. 
in the big series with plenty of embolism that I am unable to publish, it stabilized at uh, 78, 77 now. That is a, a, a possibility of embolism. So, uh, so I don't repeat what I said with the calf vein very far to the heart. Yes. And, uh, and there are some uh, works in a uh, more project. possible and sometimes I will try do I have a microconvex probe here? I will take this pen. Uh, do you see me correctly? Yes. If you yes, if you had this magic probe, you can insert it just above the sternum or in an area where no other probe will come. And sometimes you will see the cross of the aorta and the right pulmonary artery, like I see you, that is uh, perfectly. And sometimes you will see a crazy movement of a clot within the right pulmonary artery. So here you can give quietly your therapy. You know that it is uh, embolism. But I repeat, if you have the magic probe, because or maybe <laughs> the, the vaginal probe can also be inserted in this area, but each millimeter makes the difference. We are calling to Philips and to Esaote and to... Keep me posted. <laughs> uh, which city do you live? In Cordoba. Cordoba. If I see you, I will take this pen uh, in this position to... If I happen to see you in your uh, institution. Okay, maybe well, it's, uh, it's, it's so nice in, in Paris. Oh, uh, we are uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Since two tomorrow. minutes, it's tomorrow. It's time, yes. It's, it's time to finish this webinar. Well, uh, the professor Lichten saying we are really lovely to uh, for this webinar. We understand uh, we, we have to, to go to, to Paris to do the SEURF. Or, or, or maybe bring Dr. Lichtenstein to South America. I don't know, I don't know from Argentina or Venezuela. Uh, well, I don't know what I, do you think, Elizabeth, what do you think? Is, is, it, is it a good idea to bring the Dr. Lichtenstein to South America uh, to do the SEURF here? Uh, maybe, maybe this year or, or, or the next year? You know, uh, from a practical point of view, if 10 people come to Paris, it makes 10 airplanes, 10 hotels. If I come to South America, it makes one airplane, one hotel. If a sure. uh, local committee makes uh, good work, uh, if I have the machine that makes me happy, <laughs> would make, uh, for me to take an airplane is like uh, being at the office. I work, it's not a lost time. But we have to wait. Uh, it's not the appropriate time for uh, transcontinental uh, transportation, unfortunately. <laughs> but think of that to uh, near future. I will be always uh, happy to come. Okay. Well, uh, I promise to you that uh, the next meeting will be in Buenos Aires. Thanks for the all panelists, uh, they're really brilliant. And uh, uh, for, for you, uh, Daniel, uh, merci, merci to, to avoir passé ces moments avec uh, nous. Uh, the, 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 the prochain meeting uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, avec un, avec un, un bain un, un et un café. Eh bien, bravo pour votre français. So, uh, when you are uh, passionate with what you do, you do not see the time uh, passing. We spent uh, two hours, but uh, I hope that it was, uh, uh, I had the feeling that the questions were uh, smart, had a, uh, level of people who do that and not people who are not convinced. Uh, so for me, year after year, it is a pleasure to see that people use it and ask uh, technical questions. 
and I hope that I will answer uh, soon about the COVID, by the way. I'm the first to hope that this pandemic will be behind us uh, very soon. Okay. Well, uh, I hope that you have uh, feel uh, comfortable with us. It, it was a very comfortable moment. Apart, because I am always uh, direct, the transmission of the ultrasound images, uh, if it is, uh, if I will have, uh, if we will all have webinars uh, during uh, one year, I don't know how long, uh, it will be a challenge. Okay. Well, I need to night, see the, good night for you. the 24 image. Well, apart from that, I wish you a good, uh, afternoon and uh, you go to work tomorrow I suppose like every day so uh, make the good work tomorrow I will wake up a little uh, later because we are a, a big team in the Ambroise Paré hospital ah. and so yes so it's a privilege that some can come a bit uh, later than others I am in second line tomorrow Well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Gracias a todos, Thanks. chicos. Eh, bueno, un placer estar con todos ustedes, como siempre. Muchas gracias voilà. a todos. It was a pleasure. Thank you, professor. And, and, gracias, uh, Elizabeth. Gracias, Elizabeth, and, and, por tu presencia. And it was uh, perfect to see Elizabeth, uh, by the way. That was a nice uh, surprise. <laughs> and, uh, and goodbye to the people that we did not see because they were just uh, listening. Fine. I have you in a big screen now. <laughs> well, okay. Thanks. Good night. Hello. Professor, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. Th thank you for all your attention, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. So, should we quitte le module?